Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on the call or on this webinar. Um, so very, um, very excited today for um, uh, for the topic uh, and the presenters, uh, the speakers that we have on this webinar. So thank you all uh, for joining. Uh, this webinar is organized in the context of the um, uh, the United Nations 2023 Datathon. Uh, so the Datathon is organized by uh, the UN and specifically um, the uh, community of experts on big data and data science, uh, together with uh, the UN Youth Group, uh, as you know and as you have seen from uh, probably from our website. Um, so I'm happy that everyone is uh, is on board. This is actually uh, uh, the the first webinar uh, after the the, the the deadline of uh, of teams applying for the datathon. Uh, so we are also more moving now to its um, uh, giving webinars, which uh, which helps hopefully uh, the teams in preparing themselves when they participate. Uh, in this uh, long weekend of uh, the 3rd to the 6th of November when the uh, um, datathon will actually uh, take place. So thank you all for uh, for joining today. Um, I am, um, yeah, the, the, the theme of this webinar is integration of geospatial information and statistics uh, for the sustainable development goals in the context of big data. So the solutions which, which your teams at the datathon are going to prepare in November need to have a geospatial element. So that's one of the uh, requirements for your for your for your solutions. And today's webinar is meant to give you some ideas about what that could be. Uh, so the speakers today will give you a better understanding of what geospatial information is and how statistics and indicators can be integrated with geospatial information. And as I said, we have three great speakers from public sector, private sector and academia. So I'm I'm very honored that we have uh, Claudio Stenner, Ken Field and Britta Ricker uh, with us today. I will give some slightly longer uh, introductions of each of the speakers uh, when when they will give their presentations. But as a first introduction, so Claudio uh, works at the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics and is also the co-chair of the United Nations Expert Group on the Integration of Statistical and Geospatial Information. Ken, he works at ESRI in California and was an academic in the UK for a long time and was also the editor of the Cartographic Journal for nine years. And then Britta works at Utrecht University in the Netherlands uh, and she is the chair of the Commission of Cartography and Sustainable Development for the International Cartographic Association. So very, very happy to have these uh, speakers today. We will start with Claudio. Uh, Claudio is a geographer with experience in regionalization, urban geography and geoprocessing. Claudio is also currently director of geosciences at IBGE, the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. And as I mentioned, is the co-chair of the UN Expert Group on Integration of Statistical and Geospatial Information. At IBGE in Brazil, he coordinates studies on urban hierarchy, urban network, definition of urban agglomerations, regionalizations, identification and mapping of slum areas, and official atlases of Brazil. So Claudio was in charge on issues related to geography and its integration with the uh, recent, so with, with statistics, sorry, and integration with statistics with the recent 2022 population census in Brazil, which uh, took place last year. Uh, in his talk, he will demonstrate the importance of potential advantages for society in the integration of statistical and geospatial information. He will also talk about frameworks that allow this integration. So with that introduction, Claudio, and all the difficult words in this, <laughs> you go, you're, going to, you, you're going to give us some clarification about what, what, what you exactly do and what, what it is all about. So Claudio, you have about uh, 
15, 20 minutes, and then we will we'll, we'll open up for a few uh, questions on that. Claudio, go ahead. Thank you very much, Hundred, for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for the audience, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk in, with uh, all of you in this uh, webinar. I will share my screen. Could you see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Thank you, Claudio. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So I, I try to, to demonstrate in my presentation the, the, the importance of the integration between statistical and geospatial information. Why do we need to integrate uh, these different kinds of information? What's the advantage for the, the society? How can you do this integration? Uh, what, the, what tools, what framework do you have to help uh, this, this integration? So let's start. Uh, this is the, the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework. This uh, framework is uh, approved by both Statistical Commission and the Global uh, Geospatial Information Manager, DGIM, uh, both boards of the United Nations. And uh, this framework uh, talks about how can we can integrate these different kinds of information. Uh, the, the first principle is talking about uh, the, uh, that you have to to produce the statistical information in the more uh, accurate, uh, geographic accurate uh, area. Uh, for example, if you have the information by address, it's very good. If you have the information, statistical information by uh, the geographic coordination, it's very good. Uh, when you use remote sense, you, you have the information by the cells, it's very good also. So that's, that's about uh, the principle one talk. The principle two talking about uh, that you have to put all this information in a, a data management environment that allow uh, the different kinds of aggregations and also uh, guarantee the confidentiality of the, the information. Uh, the principle three talking about uh, the common geography, a, a set of uh, uh, geographs that allow a better analysis of the statistical information that uh, uh, give more meaning uh, uh, of the, the to, to the statistical uh, information. The principle four talking about the the needs of the interoperability both uh, to, to the statistical and geospatial information, and the principle five talking about the needs to uh, this information to be accessible and usable. Uh, this is also a, a, a set of geospatial information that helps a lot, uh, all kinds of integration and all kinds of analysis based uh, on geography, based on territory. Uh, this uh, uh, global fundamental geospatial that team is a, a starting point. Uh, it represents a uh, support in geospatial information infrastructure, uh, both for the 2030 agenda uh, as well for the production of integrated statistical geospatial uh, information. Uh, this uh, documentation is available on the UN GGIM sites. Uh, talking about again the, the global statistical geospatial framework uh, and talking about the input and output. You can, uh, in, uh, as an input, you, uh, you can use the fundamental data as that I said in the last slide. Also, uh, a new kind of uh, data, remote sensing data, uh, data produced by census, data produced by a uh, mobile phone, for example, as a geospatial information. And you can introduce also a census data, uh, surveys data, statistical uh, from big data and other sources in the statistical site, put in the geospatial, uh, the, the GSTF, and you have as outputs integrated data, harmonized and standardized information interoper with interoperability, comparability that allows better analysis, better diffusion, and better uh, decision-making process. Uh, the GSGF, you're talking about the resource available, uh, is available uh, uh, itself in, in English, Arabic, Chinese, uh, French, Portuguese, uh, and Spanish. Uh, they, uh, you have also the 
the GSTF implementation guide that when you have a, a more uh, detailed uh, information about how you can impl implement the GSTF, and that includes uh, experience of how the GSTF is implemented by 29 member states and two regional uh, commission, uh, including how to assist the response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, this documentation is available in this address uh, that I highlighting had in these uh, slides. So why integration of statistical and geospatial information is important? Why do you need this? First, because it saves money. Uh, when you, you put these things together, you can produce better information and uh, you you avoid overlap of, of production and you can uh, do a better decision making process so we save money more important uh, with this integrated uh, information you can improve life quality uh, in, in order to leave no one behind you need to know where uh, things happen in the space in the territory because you need to develop any specific policies uh, to improve life quality of people that are living some some place in some somewhere in the in the earth. And more important, it helps to save lives uh, with this integrated information. For example, when you have the better information and how many people live in an uh, area that can be flooded and uh, and can be affected by uh, uh, mass movement in the, in the mountains, uh, so we can in save lives with this integration. Uh, so uh, I will talk about a little with some principles of the GSTF, uh, illustrated by some examples. Uh, why uh, this integrated is a, an advantage? First, the GSTF can faci facilitate the integration between statistical and geospatial information from different sources. And also, uh, when you put everything together, different uh, kinds of information can be analyzed together, uh, improv improving a lot the understanding of the uh, studied phenomenon. Another advantage is when you have this information integrated, it provides a more accurate view of the distribution of people, households, human and natural phenomena in the territory. It, that's improving a lot the location for human and financial resources. This is a, 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 an example of the census, of Brazilian census. Uh, here you, you can see that each yellow dot is one household and it's possible to see where people live in the territory. It's the uh, Foz Iguaçu, Iguaçu Falls region in Brazil. It's the it, it, uh, Itaipu Hydroelectric uh, Dam here, the National Park of Iguaçu here, and you can see the cities along the, the whole world. And here you can see the uh, uh, here you can see the sea, the people living along the river uh, valleys. Just uh, another example of how this, uh, when you put the information in the space, when you put the information with the localization, you can understand it better, everything. Uh, this is an example of Porto Alegre in the south uh, part of Brazil, and the population uh, surround it. There is a very uh, uh, dense rural area, uh, rural occupation with small profits that uh, it is distributed along the river valleys, as you can see in this image. And also it's possible to see the summer pressure in the, this coast area uh, uh, near Porto Alegre. This region is completely different. It's a uh, uh, rural uh, area also in the Bahia state in Brazil. And if, as you can see, there is a very few uh, uh, households in the rural area in these parts of Brazil, because uh, this area is a large scale soil being produced or large mechanized properties. And the rural density is very, very slow in this kind of uh, rural uh, occupation. Here it's possible to see the the escarpment uh, area and the after the escarpment area, the rural population is much more dense than this uh, area with uh, very big uh, properties. 
Uh, this is a very interesting for me because it's a uh, population distribution in the Amazon River region in Brazil. Uh, it's possible to see the uh, distribution of uh, population, uh, the riverside population in this island, in Tocantins River uh, in Brazil, and also in these small streams, small channels inside the, the island. So, uh, Let's start talking about uh, advantages of this integration. Uh, one very important advantage: this, when you have these different kinds of informations put together, it provides new information. It can only be achieved when the statistical and geospatial data are integrated and put together. This is an example of uh, FTG uh, 11.2.1, the proportion of the population that has convenient access to public transportation. Uh, to produce this, you need uh, georeference information from the demographic census and also georeference information uh, on public transportation and put this different kinds of information together to produce this information, to produce these statistics. Uh, also, uh, this the, the integrated data provides a great mean of true statistical information. Uh, when you have a set of common geographs, the principal tree of the, the GSGF, uh, based on typologies, regional division, political administrative divisions, it allows the evolution evaluation of statistics in sign significant geographs for a better understanding of society and to be a better uh, policy. This is an example of the, the Islam of Paraisopolis in this site and the, the very wealthy neighborhood of Murumbi that's been very close to these land areas. And uh, to produce a good statistics, these two areas and needs to be anal analyzed in, in, in separ separately. To do uh, this, you have to map in these land areas uh, in order to put the statistics in, in separate, uh, to separate the statistics between the model B and the Paris Opolis in this example. Uh, a concrete example of how important it is to separate this uh, kind of statistics. This is uh, uh, a neighborhood in, in South area, in the, it's a rich area from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is a neighborhood of Lemmy, uh, in, in, but inside the, this neighborhood you have two island areas, uh, as you can see here in this uh, light pink in, in the image. And when you analyze this data together uh, with the uh, rich area, together with the island areas, you have the uh, statistics that 22.9% of this population has a uh, higher, uh, higher education. But when you, you separate these different kinds of areas, it's that they people live very close, but it, the, the characteristics, the socioeconomic uh, characteristics of these people are very different. When you separate this information, uh, you have a, a completely different information. Only 1.3% of the people uh, that live in this area has higher education. Uh, and and the 49.9 percent uh, of people that live in other areas that not slum areas in this part of the city has a higher education. So uh, that's illustrated the importance to separate. Uh, 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 do you have a a, a, a a good geography, a better geography to understand the society? Another example: it's a uh, uh, urban footprint. Uh, uh, Produced by remote sensing, by of observation. This is uh, uh, the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte. Uh, uh, as you see, the, the, the boundary in uh, yellow line. Uh, the gray line is it's the boundary between different municipalities. To understand this phenomenon, you, you need to uh, delimitate the metropolitan region and you need to produce a statistic by the metropolitan region because. It, the, the the urban uh, phenomenon cannot be understood in when you analyze when you analyze each municipality uh, separately in separate separate way. Uh, 
So you need to have this common geography to better understand this phenomenon that can be used to produce the information, the indicator, SDG indicator, 11.3.1 rate of land consumption uh, and growth rate population. And uh, talking up uh, uh, to one more time about this population in Amazon region and uh, how it's, it's possible to improve public policy through the statistical information integrated with their spatial thinking this region. Let's see this area in, the, in, in a zoom. In this area, in this example, you can imagine the need for school can be uh, accurately mastered for the population that live in this small channel inside the, the, the island. And also you can design a, a much better uh, and efficient treated water supply network to this small village in the rural area of the Amazon. But you need the, uh, all the information uh, placed in somewhere, geocode in, in the the territory. Uh, so common geography principle three of GSTF may include things such as uh, municipalities, urban agglomerations, neighborhoods, watersheds, biomes, vegetation types, statistical grids, and much more. This is very important to provide a better meaning of all kinds of statistics, including uh, uh, for sure the statistics produced by uh, all kinds of big data, such as uh, remote sensors, uh, mobile data, and more. Uh, talking about the, the importance of uh, the, to, to have this information in, a, for, in the small areas and also in a usable and easy way to provide access to everybody. This is uh, an integrated information provided by US Census Bureau. Uh, and the, in, order to, in order to leave no one behind, you need the information available to uh, in small areas uh, because a much more efficient public policy needs this kind of geographic disaggregation. Uh, this other example, talking about the principle four of GSTF, it's uh, the, when you adopted the GSTF, you can provide the information based on international standards and the information can be made available uh, in accessible and inter interoperable way uh, and with uh, and common formats like CSV, Shapefile, or PNG, etc. Uh, all these principles are applied in the context of big data, remote sensor data, mobile location service information, transportation and moving object information, smart city information, etc. becomes more meaningful when anal analyzed with a set of relevant common geographs. A statistics generated from big data gain more use and value by society when this information is located in the territory and made available in an interoperable way and accessible way and in a usable way. Uh, so uh, the GSGF can provide a guidance to carry out this integration, uh, specific uh, big data session in this context of statistical geospatial integration is planned uh, in the ongoing GSTF update uh, that probably will launch uh, next year uh, in order to improve the understanding of statistical geospatial integration in the context of big data. But uh, the GSTF itself, as it is now, it's uh, completely applied in the context uh, of big data, uh, as I show in the slides. Uh, and uh, to finish my presentation, why statistical geospatial integrated information is important, can be applied to save money, improve life quality, and save lives. Uh, that's why it allows the production of information for small areas. And the, also, it allows to find the most relevant geography to produce meaningful statistics and better reveal uh, about the reality of the society. It allows a public policy to be more efficient and focus in order to leave it, no one behind. It allows more sophisticated analysis to be carried out based on territory uh, and the, with the integration uh, of different, uh, different kinds of information, different teams. It allows also more efficient in a public and 
private investments. It also, it also reduces the possibility of conflicts because uh, when you carry out analysis and actions uh, based on territories where people live, you can reduce this kind of conflicts because you can uh, think in, in all and, and now things that happen in the place, in the it place of the, the conflict. Uh, that's it. Just to finish you one more example with Amazon Visual that I like very much. This uh, eight yellow dots is a household in a Chico Mendes Strategic Reserve in the state of Acre, Brazil, in the Amazon region. And the green uh, line is the boundary of this uh, uh, strategic reserve. And the dots in the image indicate uh, households with, uh, within, inside the Amazon forest, uh, the, with the people that you call it seringueiros. They walk into the forest to extract the latex, the raw material for natural herbs. Uh, and that's a, a completely different way of life that it, the, the great information can reveal uh, to, to us. That's it. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claudio, for this uh, for, for this um, quick overview of all the various areas of uh, of of getting um, statistics integrated with uh, uh, with the geospatial layers. Um, so I asked, uh, and I forgot to mention it uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, if people can put uh, questions in the chat, uh, then we can pick it up from there. Uh, I, I have a question to you, uh, Claudio. On um, so, so I would imagine, but maybe you can uh, uh, let me know better. Is that um, mo are most of the statistics and indicators that uh, are produced in Brazil currently geocoded? Right. I, I imagine that the population census is fully geocoded, but there might also be surveys and other. Uh, um, information that you have and then in the geocoding what is what is your let's say a unit of of coding in that how do you do it you showed a little bit the um uh this common geographies uh so the units mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. so if you can give us a little bit of idea about uh how it is coded that's one and then i'm particularly interested also in the slums and informal settlements because those are um uh, our households uh, which are uh, vulnerable and um, maybe you can also say a little bit you showed a few examples uh, if you can say a little bit about how how brazil is is doing some risk analysis uh, i don't know if it is in relation to flooding or other things uh, if you have some examples on that please go ahead okay okay uh, honor uh, so uh, first about the, uh, talking about the gel coding uh, the most of uh, Brazilian information uh, is geocoded by address, especially census information and some other economic information also is geocoded by address. When you have the information geocoded by address, it's the better world because you can uh, aggregate and the an analysis produces all kinds of analysis with this um, information. Uh, we have some samples that you don't uh, have the information by address because you, you can't analyze by address. You can use it as some common geographs to analyze this information, like it, uh, sometimes it's municipality, sometimes it's metropolitan region, and it's, sometimes it's, it's a bigger uh, area, bigger region, uh, in order to allow the sample uh, uh, expansion. Uh, so I think the common geography is very, very, very important to produce and to maintain a, a set of common geographies to uh, put all kinds of statistics together in these common geographies and analyze together. In Brazil, we have more than, uh, more than, more than 25 common geographies that uh, we are currently using in, in statistical dissemination and analysis. Um, uh, and the, the, uh, the other question, yeah, uh, it's about the uh, yeah, specifically on the on the slums and the oh, uh, this was. yeah, the, in the because you you, yeah. you you showed a few examples. I yeah. know you're working on that and how that uh, yeah, how how there is also like in risk in risk analysis uh, how you look at that yeah. Yeah, yeah, you you put a lot of effort to to better mapping the island areas in Brazil. Uh, it's very common in Brazil 
uh, things uh, like I show in the images, sometimes these land areas are uh, inside, you're very close to the more uh, wealth uh, neighborhoods. So uh, it, it's, it's completely, like, it's crucial to separate these, these different kinds of areas to understand the society and to produce uh, uh, statistics, uh, good statistics uh, uh, that in, to, to solve problems. Uh, so uh, before census, uh, using uh, remote sensing, uh, we carried out a, a big map and operation of all, ki all kinds of island areas, different kinds. And also uh, we talk with municipalities to help us to identify the, the, the island areas and the when you when the enumerators go to the field during the census, we already know where is the island areas is, and our island areas is a red mapping. So that's why you 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 you, you mapping this this kind of occupation. Right. We have also um, uh, a, a partnership uh, with another government uh, institution. To produce statistics from to the the uh, risk areas uh, areas, let's see, it's not exactly the same areas of Islam that we have mm -hmm. some slums that are not on risk, but you, you have areas that are not slums that are on risk. Right. Uh, they provide the, the geological um, uh, mapping to us, and you put the census information uh, inside these these areas in order to know the characteristics and how many people live in these in these areas. And exactly. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's great. No, I, I fully I fully understand. So if you yeah, also uh, like the uh, age distribution of people where they live and so forth. So these things I can yeah. imagine that and the size of the household. Yeah. Uh, OK, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there, there, there are some questions in the in the chat. Um, maybe you can have a quick look at that. Uh, not now, but uh, while uh, Ken will present uh, and then you can uh, re reply to that. A very last uh, question, and if you can answer briefly, is like um, these teams at the Datathon will be interested to see what kind of data sets would be available to the public. So are in Brazil, are, are um, most of these data sets available to the public or? Um, um, yeah, if you can give a little comment on that. Uh, uh, almost all data, all IBG data are available to, for free to the public. It's a, it's a policy of IBG uh, to okay. all, all data public. Excellent. So we'll we'll also try to make sure that 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 we make that visible on our website. All of the data sets that they could get possibly access to. So th thank you very much, Claudio. That was great. Um, and I will uh, now go to Ken. Uh, so Ken Field. Uh, Ken, Ken has uh, Ken is located in California and has over uh, thirty years of uh, experience in uh, in cartographic uh, education. Uh, Ken makes maps, writes about maps, teaches about maps, and talks about making, writing, and teaching about maps. So his focus is on helping people make better maps by design. So maps are his passion and his profession. Um, after 20 years of academic career in the UK, Ken moved to the US where he works at Esri in California. Ken was the editor of the Cartographic Journal for nine years and teaches an open online course on cartography, which has so far had over 200,000 participants. Ken is also the, uh, the author of two award-winning books, namely Cartography of 2018 and the Thematic Mapping, which was published in 2021. And in Ken's own words, he snowboards reasonably well, he plays drums badly, and is a long-suffering supporter of his hometown Premier League football club, Nottingham Forest. Ken. It's all up to you. Thank you for being here with us. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me just do the obligatory sharing. OK, can you all see? Yes, can see the screen. OK, OK, thank you very much for confirming. OK, um, well, 
again, thank you very much for, for the invite. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Mark Isler for the um, statistics division for um, for offering the invite to come and talk to you today. Um, I, I maybe come at this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, my expertise is in uh, is in cartography and mapping, um, whether that's small data or big data, and whether it's for um, mapping deforestation or or SDGs or or whatever. Uh, particular thematic um, uh, data sets that might be of interest to a particular constituent. Um, so I'm not going to talk specifically about the SDGs, but what I am going to try to do is illuminate the conversation about making maps uh, from the perspective that not all maps are necessarily truthful and you can basically imbue meaning in maps in many, many different ways um, to create different perspectives. So whatever data set you're using, you can build um, all sorts of interesting um, comments through the delivery of the map uh, that will speak to one person in one way and speak to another person in another way. And I think reflecting on that is very important, particularly at the outset of, of something like the Datathon, where you're perhaps trying to find ways of thinking about the data and deciding what types of stories you want to tell with the data. So um, in that respect, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about COVID-19 data. I'm going to talk a little bit about US election data. Um, they're the data sets I've been working on, particularly in the last few years. And it's the last few years have, have been quite literally a viral moment for geography and cartography. Um, just because we've seen many more visuals that describe things like patterns of disease. So let me start off with um, a very famous map. I hope many of you will um, know this map. This is what's often referred to as the John Snow cholera map from uh, the cholera outbreak in London, Soho in London in 1854. And we think we know this map. It's a very famous map. And the story goes that um, Dr. John Snow noticed a pattern in cholera deaths. He made a map by a particular pump. He then ripped the pump off the handle and the outbreak abated. And if you move on, lives were saved. Modern thematic mapping was born. Disease mapping was born. The principles of GIS were established through this ingenious layered map. And he invented epidemiology. And, and that's a very interesting story, but un unfortunately, um, none of it is the truth. Um, he'd already had a theory some years previously. Um, it's just that the 1854 outbreak gave him more data. Um, the authorities themselves removed the pump handle in the September of the epidemic, even as it was waning, based partly on Snow's findings. But the real kicker here is this map hadn't even been made by then. It was first shown in December 1854. And did Snow even invent the, the, the technique? Well, no, because here's a 1798 study of yellow fever in New York City. By... So that's the John Snow map. Um, then I spoke a little bit about um, th this being a, a precursor to that map. Uh, this is a map drawn by Edmund Cooper of the Metropolitan Commission of Sewers uh, before Snow even started his version. Um, very similar, I, th I think you'd probably agree. Um, and this is actually a second version of John Snow's map, and he didn't even draw it. Um, it was drawn by uh, somebody called Charles Sheffins, um, and he wrapped a boundary around the marks on the map to show where the cholera uh, existed, the walking distance, I guess you could call it. And he also corrected um, a problem with the map, which was that the pump handle uh, or the Broad Street pump had been plotted in the wrong place on the first map. So really, um, and this was an example of, of another doctor working in the same time in the same place um, on the same sort of data. And really all I was trying to use this first example to show that um, it's likely that um, many different people work on data sets um, at the very same time and certain maps become famous, some don't, and certain um, ideas perhaps start to permeate very in very similar ways. Um, but maps lie and the story about the John Snow map that I was talking about um, is, is a fantastic cartographic lie. Um, in geographical circles, we've always known that maps lie. Mark Mamonio in his 1991 book 
how to lie with maps, um, you know, revealed that the choices that map makers make consciously or unconsciously mean that every map inevitably presents only one of many possible stories about the places it depicts. And so I was really trying to use this as a context to say that um, there isn't simply one immutable way to map a particular data set. If you ask 10 cartographers or 10 teams in the datathon to make a map, you're going to get 10 different maps. And that's not a bad thing. It would be certainly boring if all maps were the same. Um, and so there isn't a single solution, I'm afraid, which might be <laughs> not what you're looking for. But it means that not all maps are made equally and there's potential to make maps in very, very different ways. And even the John Snow cholera map has been made in many different ways. So I then turned attention to the COVID pandemic and looked at this map from the World Health Organization. It looks authoritative, the organization's authoritative, the map and the data appear authoritative, but there's a lot of cartographic issues going on here that are problematic. The projection, the way in which the data has been processed, the non-linear classification. And because of this and a number of other maps uh, that I was seeing around the same time, I wrote a blog um, early on in the, the COVID pandemic um, to basically encourage people to try to map a little bit more truthfully and to counter the rush for people to map data uh, just to put out something on social media and put to push their own maps. Um, most were small scale thematics at that time. They were simple with just the basic facts. And I, that blog got a, a lot of views and this very esteemed geographer said something nice about it and he's got a blue tick. So that must mean he's right, right? Um, except what you need to understand is Ed is a good friend of mine um, and he followed it up saying it was only February. So it was a decent blog for that time of year. So you can't always believe what you read in the same way that you can't always see what you um, sort of believe what you see on a map. So I made some maps to illustrate some of the issues that I hope you can sort of take forward when you're making your own maps uh, as the, for the datathon. Um, one of the first jobs is picking a, a map projection. Um, a good choice for China is Alba's equal area. If it's thematics you're dealing with, equal area is, is a good choice, or probably the only real choice. Um, Web Mercator doesn't support a map's purpose because distortions lead to under or overestimation of whatever it is you're trying to show. And that has the effect of propagating people's impressions of less or more in different places. Uh, I created a choropleth, but this is just totals. Um, it's reasonably looking. Um, there are very few golden rules in mapping, but one of them is really that you shouldn't use totals. Because here you see there's five areas that are mapped in the same dark red shade. Um, does that mean that those five areas have similar characteristics? But we don't know whether uh, Hubei has 100,000 people, 100 million people. Um, we do know it's got 65,000 coronavirus cases, but that's about all. Um, and it seems that 1,000 cases is used as a key breakpoint. Um, and I'm not sure that's a good thing to show in the legend. And red, it's a public health disaster. Red maybe has other connotations. So looking at the data is key before you get to even making a map. Look at the outliers, look at the distribution. You can see here that Hubei is a massive outlier and all of the regions are way below that breakpoint of a thousand cases. So that map before was a very poor choice. This might be better. It shows Hubei as an outlier. Um, you know, perhaps a better thing to do is to is to show outliers where they exist or to show other areas similar characteristics where they exist. Uh, let me skip that or you could use dot density. This is a different technique where each dot is encoded with a particular value. Here one dot is equal to 10 cases of um, COVID-19. The dots are positioned randomly though, so one of the drawbacks of this technique is sometimes people infer that um, the uh, the dot implies location, which it doesn't. So you have to explain that uh, with a small statement. Or proportional symbols are a really useful thematic mapping technique where you can use totals and the area of the symbol is scaled according to the data value itself. But um, here, Hong Kong and Macau don't necessarily stand out, even though they're highly populated areas, but they're in a very small land area. So sometimes if the data in those small 
but largely populated areas is important for the map, you might need an inset, a different map, or use multi-scale properties of a web map. Graduated symbols is a, another good example where you can set a, an upper and a lower limit for what you're showing with a particular symbol size. Um, but you might ask yourself here, does it show uh, Hubei as the outlier it actually is? Um, and there's things not to do. I won't go into the detail about this, but it's an interpolated surface with really poor color choices. Um, this is actually a pretty default view if you select this type of uh, map type, um, so-called heat map, but it does nothing for either the data or the communication to the audience. Neither does sometimes 3D where you have um, uh, extruded polygons, which you know is, is almost gratuitous. Now, the interesting thing about writing that blog and hopefully doing talks like this is it encourages people to make better choices. And certainly in the UK at the time, the Times newspaper, the BBC, um, used my blog in order to make their maps in the early pandemic better, uh, as did uh, many other different um, organisations. And when I'm thinking about mapping and the sort of things I'd like to encourage you to think about are how do you step back from the map to ensure truth and objectivity in the process? Um, this is a set of um, principles established by Borden Dent in his book in 2008. Um, and I updated them and modified them for my book. And I think they provide a sort of a useful, practical way of thinking about and applying truthfulness to your own process of making a map. So I'm not going to go through them in detail. Um, I did that before about 20 minutes ago, um, but you all missed it. Um, so take a screenshot uh, or use the slides afterwards um, and reflect on some of these ideas um, that help you to frame your own work um, in as truthful a way as you possibly can. Um, and I took those ideas into making maps of elections, which is the second major sort of area of work I've been involved with recently, to make a range of different maps to show people the alternatives that are possible when you're mapping a, a particular data set. And um, this happened to be a political data set. I turned it into a book. And this really stems from the idea that people often ask me and often ask cartographers, what's the best way to make this map? Or what map do I use to show this? And the answer is quite often, it just depends um, because you can create many different stories from the data. So I created this book as an atlas of options, really. You can flick through it, look at the map type and say, I'd like my map to do that because I understand this map portrays this type of story or tells this type of story. Um, so there's 101 maps in here. Um, of the same data set, which sounds hideously boring, but I hope it isn't. So you get to, I got to do the basics. I talk about projections and color and typography and all the usual stuff, but then get into more detail. Um, here's a value by alpha map. It uses um, opacity to suppress low, low populated areas to promote or focus the areas where um, more votes were coming from. But I think what I'd like to point out here quickly is just um, the annotations I put around it. So what the book does is describe what works well on the map, what doesn't work so well, what the map's good at showing, what it isn't so good at showing, and how it actually um, encodes the data in a way that shares a very specific message. So we might just be interested in showing um, areas of change, certainly for elections, where they're won or lost is important. So these are the counties where change happened. Everything else stayed the same from the previous election cycle. Or looking at change over time, small multiples or maps of different time slices can be very useful to look at trends and cycles. Um, you can be playful if the data set supports being a little bit playful, perhaps here with proportional symbols of party, um, the parties themselves, or through using dot density here shows the, you know, amazing sparsity of the population distribution in the US, um, as well as the sort of hot pots of hot spots of um, voting behavior. You can put the data on the map itself with with a label um, because then people can actually look at the number itself if you feel that the numbers are important. Maybe change is important by using different symbol types here, just an arrow to show where 
uh, political intent move perhaps left or right over a voting cycle. You might just want to make a flag. Or you might go very graphical using very specific cartogram techniques. You might go gridded and combine them with graph types of certain certain types here, Sankey diagrams. Um, so the, the, the entire talk, um, and I missed out a bit of detail in just this sort of short overview, I, I appreciate that, is that um, bar one or two map types, none are right or wrong, and some are going to speak to some audiences more than others, some are going to do a better job than others. Um, so if you're designing any map to report any empirical data, whether it's cholera, COVID-19, elections or SDGs, um, you need to appreciate the data and how the choices of making the map are going to be read by the people or the audience reading the map. So being able to recognise bias in a map's representation is a good starting point for that. And it's an important issue because it plays to people's views, opinions and their own search for truth in what it is that they're, they're reading. Um, I threw in a Treasure Island map because X doesn't always mark the spot. This proves it. Um, this is the Robert Louis, Louis Stevenson's classic Treasure Island map. X didn't mark the spot. It was a blatant lie, even though the map was actually quite nice. Um, and that was that. So um, hopefully I haven't dropped off again. No, you did not. We heard everything. And thank you very much, Ken. This was great. Hooray. Thank you. Thank you. I, had, um, I also I think it, it really complements each other well between uh, uh, presentations of Claudio, Britta and yours about various ways of, uh, of, of looking and, uh, uh, and visualizing data. So this is, uh, this is great. Um, all right, so that was a, a bit of a, a disrupted uh, presentation and we'll move and try to improvise here. Britta, uh, Britta, so this is uh, Britta Ricker. Britta is a, a digital geographer in the environmental science group of the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at uh, the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She is also the chair of the Commission of Cartography and Sustain Sustainable Development for the International Cartographic Association. So Britta is a FAIR, so F-A-I-R, FAIR, a Data and Software Open Science Fellow, and focuses on the use of open data, open software and open science for cartographic production. Her work bridge, bridges qualitative and quantitative research by identifying practical solutions for spatial data collection, management and effective geo-visualization of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at the local and global level. So in this talk, uh, Britta will share examples from her open access book called Mapping for a Sustainable World which was published uh, with the United Nations and the International Cartographic Association. And she will also give some ideas for future SDG spatial data solutions. Britta, to you. Hey, thank you. Please Can you ahead. see my slides? Uh, I have to see, I have to switch. Let me see. <laughs> no, well, that's just, just me. Okay. Yes, I'm yes, a, yes, I'm yes, we, up, we, so. yes, we see. Yes, we see. Okay, yeah. great. Please go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Bella. Please go ahead. All right. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how we are currently mapping the sustainable development goals and some hopes for the future. So I'm going to be talking to you about understanding, analyzing and visualizing big data. Uh, so as we all know, uh, sustainable development uh, is a pressing problem and the United Nations has recognized this for a long time. So when we, t we throw this term around a lot, but I think it's really important that we take a minute to define it. So sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability for future generations to meet their own needs. So that could mean access to water and sanitation, access to food, education. Um, and so the United Nations has identified 19 sustainable development targets and to measure how close or far each country is to meeting these targets, they've identified 169 uh, targets and 200 47 different indicators. Now the indicators are the actual data that are being collected to measure how close and far every country is to meeting these goals. And every country is responsible for 
um, collecting these data and then sharing it with the United Nations. So that's a form of data sovereignty, uh, which means the United Nations isn't collecting these data. It's the individual countries themselves that are collecting and sharing it. But that can be a really uh, big and difficult task. Um, so with this book, Mapping for a Sustainable World, we wanted to show what was possible with the given open SDG indicator data that are currently available. So this is one of the insets from the book. Um, this is associated with goal number five, achieving gender equality and empowerment for all women and girls. This is an example of a choropleth map. And as Ken was alluding, you make a lot of different decisions um, when you're making maps for which information you want to pop out. Where do you want the user's eye to be drawn? So here we made a, a, a couple of decisions. Um, we labeled those countries that have more than 50% women in uh, positions of parliament and uh, in positions of power. Um, and the darker green means more. Um, this map is maybe a little bit jarring and maybe a little bit off-putting because it's unfamiliar. This is called a cartogram. So in this, this map, what we did was we distorted area by a number, by a value. Um, and so in this, this map, you can see that China and the US are larger because they are um, they have higher GDP. Uh, they're, they're darker color because they have high GDP and they're larger because they um, are emitting the most CO2 out of any other country in the world. So we want your, your attention to be drawn there because that's what we're trying to communicate in, the, in, this, uh, in this map about the SDGs. So the, uh, the whole book, it's a textbook um, about cartography and mapping, and we're using the SDG indicator as examples. And again, these are all open data sets. Here are the different authors. Um, we have Menno Young Krak, who's the former president of the ICA, the International Cartographic Association, Dr. Rob Roth from uh, University of Wisconsin, myself, and then we have a number of UN authors as well. So this was really a joint publication, and you can download it for free um, on the UN library website. So I highly encourage you to download a copy and take a look for yourself. Um, there are 94 maps of real SDG indicator data, um, and there's different schematic maps and diagrams, so it's just chock full of beautiful information. And now I'm going to move through and kind of discuss with you what I was thinking during the process and what I what I thought about the data and um, what, what I learned from this process. So when we were making this this book, the first thing we did was we took an inventory of all the SDG indicator data. So there's tier one, tier two, and tier three data, which means um, uh, tier one is the most complete, uh, tier two is next, and then tier three is, uh, it's been identified, but it's not um, complete. Oh, okay, I'm seeing, I'm getting messages that people cannot see the slides. Can, uh, is anyone else having this problem as well? Uh, I can um, see the slides. Yeah, me too, so. Maybe they have to double click on the, uh, on that uh, shared content. Uh, uh, okay, so now they're saying yeah. now we can, then thank you for uh, that okay. tip, I think. Good. I think that helped out some people. Yeah. Um, what you can also see in this graphic is that, so on the top, that uh, dark blue is tier one, light blue is tier two, and then the um, gray is tier three, which means it's been defined, but there, there's no data yet. Um, so we focused on the tier one data to map. Um, then we also categorized data by, is it proportional? Is it, um, are they uh, raw data? And because that influences what types of maps can, can then be made, what types of thematic maps. So um, what we show here are different types of thematic maps. You have proportional symbol, where you have the size of the symbol uh, designates, um, designates uh, how, how much of that uh, 
of, of how much of it is being represented. We have dot density maps, we have choropleth maps or shaded isoline maps. Now, each of these different types of maps are good for different types of data. So if you're representing um, a discrete but abrupt phenomenon, so if something's happening in one point and it stops quickly at that point, uh, then you might want to do a proportional symbol map. But if that uh, phenomenon is smooth and continuous, like elevation, um, then that is you would want to do an isoline map. So you think about temperature or uh, like I said, elevation. So there are different types of thematic maps that are most appropriate for different types of phenomenon. Now, um, with the existing open SDG indicator, uh, the most, the easiest and most common type of map to make is a choropleth map because there's a single value for each of these uh, indicator data that are associated with each country. So um, we have uh, the symbol would be the polygon, the, the shape of the country. Um, and in this case, the visual variable is value because it's ordinal data. Um, and we used an Eckerd 4 projection for the, the global scale and uh, the data are normalized. So it's a percent of the population. With choropleth maps, you always want to normalize either by area, by population, by something. Um, so I wanted to take this example of goal number 15, which is to protect and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss. So that's a very big goal. Um, so when you go down to a more focused target, target 15.1 uh, by 2020, ensure conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater ecosystems and their services, uh, in particular forests, um, that's a little bit more specific. And then this indicator shows forested area as a proportion of total area. So here we have, again, a choropleth map. It's normalized by uh, proportional area. And here we've aggregated data um, at the M49 regional level. So you see North America, South America, um, North Africa and Central Africa. Now, when we aggregate at this regional uh, area, you can start to see some, some trends, um, but we have to be careful. So here I've uh, outlined Chad, and that's because this has caused the modifiable aerial unit problem. So uh, the same individual level data when enumerated at a different set of polygons. So in this case, going from the country to the regional level, um, you start to see different a different phenomenon. Here's an example of just random points, and when they're aggregated in a different types of grids, uh, you start to see different patterns. And so this is known as the modifiable aerial unit problem. And um, we really are uh, we need to be aware of this in terms of the decisions we make in terms of how we aggregate different regions. And I think this is really important with. Uh, with tree cover, especially because if we look at the remotely sensed data, this is um, the global remotely sensed data uh, that Hansen has aggregated and shared publicly with us. Um, now, if we look at the same area with Chad, you can see that um, it's actually mostly desert uh, and there's very little forest, but that middle area, that middle Africa area, the value changes because Congo is very densely forested, so it makes the whole region appear to be more forested. So we have to be very, very uh, careful with that. Um, also, there are different definitions of forests in different countries. Now, the UN has the each, uh, each curation agency curating each of the indicators offers a really useful, helpful set of metadata, which is the methodology in terms of how to collect that data. Um, but uh, while it's really useful, sometimes it's a little bit ambiguous, but in this case, it's pretty specific. Um, but different countries have different definitions of forests. So I want to talk about that a little bit here. Now, uh, now we're zooming into Aruba. Aruba is a, uh, a small island in the Caribbean, 
and the red regions are the mangroves. So that's all that's counted by using that UN definition of um, forested area as a proportion of the total area would be 2.3% of Aruba because they can only count the mangroves. Um, but when you look at uh, the vegetation in Aruba, they actually have a lot of tropical dry forests, but it doesn't fall within that definition of forest by the UN because they're not very tall. Um, and so the UN does say that it's okay to localize indicators. Sometimes we need that uh, for local uh, environmental regulation and conservation efforts, and that is that is quite okay. So here are some examples of mangroves, but also some photos of these tropical dry forests I was telling you about. And I'm also working with them now. We're taking our own imagery using drones and uh, uh, quantifying the forested area that way. And this is where it gets really exciting, where Earth observation data can really help. So um, with a lot of the openly available Earth observation data or remotely sensed imagery, it's multispectral, which means that you can see beyond what your eye sees. You can also capture the near infrared. So that way we can monitor um, NDVI, which shows healthy versus unhealthy vegetation. So when we go back to Aruba, again, that red area are the mangroves that are counted. But in the wet season, you can see that there's a lot of really healthy uh, vegetation that that is sequestering carbon that's really in, important for biodiversity. Um, and so this NDVI using uh, open data, uh, you can really start to see how uh, dense and valuable these data are. So um, there are efforts going on to localize sustainable development indicators to delineate and uh, quantify the spatial extent of, of some of these, these localized ecoregions. And this is where big data comes in. Um, this is an example from MODIS data that's publicly available. Um, and I made these animations using Google Earth Engine. So Google has uh, taken an inventory of all of the satellite imagery that's publicly available from the EU, from the US, and a number of other data sources. And you can actually interact with it on Google servers um, to make animations like this. So this is showing um, the, the health of plants over one year. Um, so you can see the pulse of the seasons for the whole entire continent of Africa. And uh, this, these scripts are publicly available and you can cut and paste them and reuse them um, and then just change the color scheme or change the year or change what you think is uh, most important for the data collection and the maps that you're trying to make. Um, there are other examples of earth observation and machine learning. So these are big data being processed with machine learning um, to capture some of these SDG indicators. So this is an example of object oriented uh, machine learning mapping sites associated with slavery, which is associated with goal 8.7. There's this uh, really nice paper that has done an inventory of all the different examples of Earth observation data and machine learning. And here's a graph of uh, the different goals and the different techniques that have been used. Now, I want to point out that these are experimental. They're not necessarily using the uh, UN metadata, so the exa exact um, methodology that they used. But this is really exciting to show what is possible. It's also important to know that we throw around these terms like machine learning and big data, but they're not a solution for everything. Um, and machine learning in remote sensing is really exciting and could be really useful for collecting this spatial data that is now becoming um, important and useful for collecting SDG indicator. Uh, but it's also important to think about not every uh, algorithm, not every machine learning technique is relevant or or uh, the best fit for every problem. So uh, we need to experiment, we need to test, uh, and we need to try them out to see which is the most important, uh, which is most relevant for each. And again, um, there's papers about this as well. I wanted to point out a quote by uh, Maypo Kwan in 2002. This is a long time ago now, but there's a need for developing dedicated algorithms instead of just using one and applying it to everything. Um, the default in your so mapping software might not be the best fit for the problem at hand. So there's some critical thinking that needs to be done. 
Um, I also want to point out that um, the UN has second administrative level boundaries, so that means publicly available data sets, again, shared by individual countries, that can be really useful for aggregating some of this big data, or this Earth observation data at the country level by the borders that the countries themselves uh, recognize. Um, so this can be a really useful data set for, for your datathon. And I also want to just take a minute to acknowledge the importance of open science to enhance SDG indicator data collection. Right now, while each country is uh, responsible sh for sharing their own data, they don't have to share how they arrived at that value. Um, but I do think open science could be a really helpful mechanism for uh, collecting SDG data because the data, the, the methods are then replicable you can compare and modify each other's methods uh, to meet your needs, to localize those indicators, to learn from each other. And open science is really a form of rigor um, to really learn from each other and test each other's methods. So I really hope that uh, we can start sharing big data in an open science environment. Um, open, open, like I said, the United Nations shares all these indicator data. Um, there's a lot of open data available uh, that can really help us. Um, now that there's also a lot of big data that are closed that would be useful for calculating some of the indicators like energy. A lot of private energy companies have these, these data behind, uh, behind walls but there's a lot of open data we can play with. Um, this idea of data provenance, I think is important. So if you collect the raw, raw data and then change it in some way, clean it, modify it, and then uh, share it, that's important to think about. Okay, the data you're working with, where did it come from? Who has been using it before? And where is it gonna go next? Um, and I also think it's the, the book, this book we used QGIS, which is an open source software. And we did this so that um, we made a number of tutorials. Uh, they're available online, so that way uh, other people can, you know, see the algorithms. They can download the software for free and uh, reuse it. So we're trying to uh, practice what we preach in terms of open science and uh, open data. So the key points I really hope you take away from this talk is that cartography is useful and powerful in identifying where innovation, innovation interventions uh, to achieve the SDGs could be placed. Um, sustainable development is inherently interdisciplinary and maps can act as this boundary object between the locals and the policymakers um, to have these important discussions about finding solutions that can be localized and work in a specific place. Um, indicators need to be localized to meet the needs of the public that they're serving and open science and big data can really, really help achieve these goals and, and make uh, accurate maps. So just remember what gets counted counts, what we count in the big data, what we count using our machine learning methods. This is going to be used to inform policy, uh, to inform what people think and take away from the map. So this is important to remember. And mapping is very powerful, so we risk reproducing inequalities uh, when we decide who and what to put on our maps. So uh, I'm going to echo Elwood and Lashinsky here and call for active engagement to combat inequalities through modern forms of map making with big data and machine learning and you. <laughs> So I feel like with the sustainable development, we're all falling out of this plane. We don't know what's going on, but we need to hold hands and wrangle this data and make these geovisualizations to help others and to make sense of this messy world. And uh, this is an involving and contested concept, but you have the skills to address sustainable development and we need to work together to achieve them. So with that, uh, I, are there any questions? So thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Britta. I think it was excellent. Um, um, yes, uh, we ha we have. So one one side note is that we haven't re-established contact with Ken yet. So uh, we'll see how that uh, further develops. But um, uh, I think first question that I have to you, Britta, uh, and and maybe uh, the 
participants also would have is um, yes, you mentioned a, a lot of various resources, and we'll probably be after you for the links, and we will probably provide those links, or we will want to provide those links on our website, so teams can later on refer to it. So the the link to the uh, to your to your book, this uh, the, the mapping for a sustainable world, uh, the link to the Google Earth. Um, um, the resources that you mentioned, uh, the link to these, uh, 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 yeah, other other, um, I, I the, the Q, what you say, Q J Q J S. Uh, yes. You you mentioned a few of those things, so uh, okay. uh, we'll we'll really be uh, interested to see uh, to see those links. But I mean, great great presentation and uh, and tons of information which is uh, which is in there. Um, I think there were there are quite a few uh, uh, questions in the chat. We have a little bit of time for uh, uh, for question and answers um, on the presentations that we have seen. Um, there, before doing that, um, I would like to. Um, um, what I would like to do is that um, uh, that I see that we will not have enough time to answer all of the questions. So if there are uh, uh, questions that uh, people in the audience have that will will that we don't have time to to answer, please send them. Uh, there's an email address I think for the datathon, and maybe Alex, you can put that email address in the in the chat so that uh, for remaining questions uh, they can uh, go there. Um, just repeating a little bit what was uh, put in the chat is that the um, the recordings will be available and the presentations will we, we would like to make available as well on our uh, uh, datathon website. So uh, so there is where you will find uh, uh, some info back some further background information. But now I will, if that is possible, and uh, I have to uh, see with my colleagues to open up some of the mics of people who have questions. I see two questions. One is from uh, Isaac. Um, and please uh, uh, indicate uh, if you get the mic uh, uh, who you are and to whom uh, you will have a question. So I would go, I have two uh, hands up, one from Isaac and one from Chukwuma. So if you could say where you, where you are from and then uh, indicate to whom you have a question. Isaac, uh, we'll first give it the floor to Isaac if he is still with us. He's got his hand up, and if he can open up his mic. Yes, Isaac, Hello. go ahead. And then after that, Shukwoma. Yes, please go ahead. And is it possible that you will share the, the presentations, please? We will do that. That was a simple question. Uh, we will certainly do that. Uh, okay. Shukwoma, if you, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I have two quick questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, so the first one is for Dr. Brita. Um, I, I heard when she mentioned the need to normalize, when creating corporate maps, the need to normalize the data. So funny enough, uh, I, I create, uh, that, that's something I've done a lot, but I, I see the option to normalize within ArcGIS and I just overlook it. Uh, can you just say something more about why that's important to important to normalize the data. Then secondly, for uh, Ken Field, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. As, so I see 101 different ways you visualized um, those maps using the same data set. How versatile do I have to be? Because when, when working with a um, proprietary GI software, and then you have some open source software, you have limited options in terms of visualization and cartography with different software. And then seeing some of the fantastic maps you created, how versatile does a GIS user have to be across different software platforms, both proprietary and open source, to achieve such a wide array of options? Thank you. Thank you, Chukwama, for these detailed questions. We, we will uh, go to the, to the presenters for this, and then in the second round, I will take all of the questions before coming back to the presenters. But uh, for this one, uh, very concrete questions. Uh, Britta, one to you, and then uh, Ken. Britta, go ahead. Well, actually, I think I'm going to punt that one to uh, Ken because he actually hinted. He, I I started it and then he 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 showed the example and explained it better. So I'm going to punt that one to you, Ken. Uh, all right. Um, I I had a feeling actually that our presentations would would have some sort of overlap anyway. So, um, it, it's really it's really 
it seems simple that you could just map anything on on a choropleth, right? And and why not totals? Because that's often the data that you have. The problem is, um, you've got um, let's say one area that's ten square miles and one area that's a hundred square miles. If you've got one in the first area, a total of one, and a total of ten in the second area. On a choropleth map, that total of 10 would be mapped in a darker shade than the one, because 10 is more than one, except they're both 10% of the area. So that the character, if you want to compare between the two areas, you are getting rid of the problem of the different size of the geography by creating a rate, okay? A percentage or the number of people per 100,000, let's say. And that's critical to be able to compare between one area and any other area on the map, which is the purposes of a choropleth map is to be able to compare across the map. Uh, that's Britta, is that is that OK or do, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I think that that sums it up. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, so the oh, oh, what I would say is if you really want to map totals, just Pick a different map type. It's not a problem. Just pick proportional symbols or dot density, graduated symbols or anything else. That's that's almost why we have a range of map types available to us, because not every data set fits every map type perfectly. Um, so the other question I think was to do with um, the, the range of, I, don't, I guess, skill sets or possibilities. The one thing I will say is, even though I, I work for Esri, um, it, it, it doesn't bother me one jot which mapping package you use, whether it's Esri's or open source or whatever. And I don't think it matters and doesn't hinder what your capabilities are. So all of the maps I've made in the book obviously use the software that I'm um, obliged to use. And you can make all of those maps using um, ArcGIS Pro. Um, and I would also suspect you can make probably all of them using QGIS and many, many other packages as well. The one thing to remember is that with all of the packages, there are probably five, six or seven default map types, the very commonly used map types. And they're, they're commonly used for a reason because they're relatively easy to construct and they're relatively well understood by the audience. Um, and we've mentioned them before. That doesn't mean to say you have to restrict yourself just to those because you might want to go down a different route with something um, a little bit more visually impressive, um, you know, maybe for a poster or something like that. Um, and there are other, other options that for many packages, for many software packages like cartograms, they're not default and they are a little harder to build and make. Um, so it's a question of just finding out the, the ways in which to do that. And I think you'll find that, you know, through my book, blogs, things Britta has written and many, many others have written, you'll find um, how to's and links to software and links to workflows to get to where you want to get with whatever you use. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the uh, of the webinar. Um, so what I'd like to do is we have four people um, um, with a hand up. Uh, so I will um, go through all four of them to uh, uh, to post their questions uh, uh, and I will ask them to uh, to be fairly brief in, in brief in uh, posting the questions. Uh, I hope that um, that Claudio, Britta and Ken have pen and pencil ready to write down the questions and then I will come back to each of you to give your uh, final views on uh, on the questions and, and of the webinar today. Uh, so I'll start. I have um, in order, I will go first to Isa, then to Isaac, uh, Hussein, and Stefan. Isa Hamadou, please, if you can open your mic and and pose your question. Isa, if you try to speak, you are still muted. Yes, please go ahead. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for the report. My name is Isa Madu. I'm from Cameroon. Actually, I have a simple question. Is there any document that we can be familiar about the data that we are going to work on? Thank you. So uh, the, if I understand the question, uh, you would like to have some links to data that are available from the presentation. Did you say that? Mm, no, I, I mean like 
is there any document that you have to like we can understand? Maybe uh, paper and the data also regarding the data told that the upcoming competition. Okay. Uh, Isa, that was hard to understand. I, I hope that the speakers pick this up, but I will I ask I will ask you if you can maybe put it in the chat. I think the question was whether uh, about the data sets available during the data thon. Uh, we will talk about the data sets and the analy analytical tools available during the data thon in our third webinar on October 19th. I have put the link into the chat but you can during the data thon you can use any publicly available data set uh, okay. that you find thanks thank you okay i'll go to isaac isaac yusuf isaac can you open your mic isaac hello hello yes please go my ahead question, if you have my a question here yeah. My concern is, would you mind to share the link of the book which you have been mentioning there? Okay, this is to uh, to Ken. So there could be, uh, yeah. So we will put uh, the link to the thematic mapping uh, uh, also for you. Uh, we go to Hussein. All right. Hussein, uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ronald, and congratulations, uh, congratulations for all presenters for uh, nice presentations. I have two questions uh, with uh, to Rika and Ken. Uh, my first question is that I have, uh, uh, I would love to hear some challenges maybe you have encountered during using uh, QGIS during your mapping. Maybe uh, for someone who is interested in using QGIS would be uh, so, um, uh, so keen uh, to address the challenges that you might have been uh, facing. My second question uh, maybe uh, should be shared uh, between Ken and Rika that maybe if one asks that uh, which is the better analytical to, uh, mapping tool between ArcGIS and QGIS, uh, which would be your uh, best recommendations for that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll note the question. Uh, Stephen Chelly, Stephen Chelly, please go ahead with your question. Stephen. Stephen, your, your mic is still muted. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. My, my question is for Mr. Claudio Stena. During your presentation, you talk about the statistical geospatial integrated information. You say that it saves money, it improves life quality, and it saves lives. For the improvement of life quality and the save of life, I don't have much problem, but what I'm looking at is the save money in which context such a, a integration of information save money when it has to do with, with, with small locations. Because it's partial there, I'm think, I think you're talking about small species. So how is this saving money? Because the information is going into, if, if I'm correct, like take for instance, you say from urban to rural areas, all those places were put in. So how is that going to save money? Can you please elaborate? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, question is well noted. Uh, Nuangang, Dian, please. Next, uh, so yeah, we, I, I think we had two more questions here. Nuang, Nuangang. I'm not If you're uh, so, speaking, you're still yeah. muted. Yeah. Nuangang, no. Uh, if you can't open the mic, please put it in the chat. Uh, and then I go to uh, Alam. Uh, as the last one, because I see that that more uh, hands go up, but we'll have to go back to the speaker. So Alam uh, yes. from Jordan. Alam, how are you? Hi, good. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, uh, Ronald, for this event. Uh, my question is, is the data set uh, that available for us during this event will help us in developing uh, SDGs like 9.1.1? Uh, so I mean the geospatial data and the resolution of the 
spatial data. Thank you. I think that is a question to the organizers. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that uh, and then I'll go back to the speaker. So the um, uh, we, 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 we're not specifically putting up uh, a satellite data for the event if you wanted to use satellite data for uh, a 911. So um, I think this is the uh, this is the indicator on uh, the proportion of of ru uh, rural population with access to all season roads um, and road condition is a, is a major issue there. Uh, I think uh, the, the sources that there are is like open street map people use. Um, we have an RAI index somewhere that you could use uh, alum, uh, but there is no specific uh, uh, other data sets that, that we would make available other than than the ones which are in the public. Yes, so thank so you. thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I uh, we we have we're running over time, so I'm going now back to the speakers and um, uh, I think we'll start with Britta, then Ken and then Claudio gets the last word. Britta, please. Great. Yeah, so uh, I think the first question was about comparing open source GIS to maybe proprietary GIS. I will not use any names and uh, maybe I can speak a little more freely than Ken on this regard. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but my my experience is uh, I try to use both in my teaching because uh, for my students, both are uh, prevalent in society and it's really an advantage to be uh, ambidextrous to be able to use both because you don't know which software your agency might use moving forward. Um, uh, I think the QGIS, or actually, oh, I used a name. QGIS, though, is the open source GIS that we use for this book. Um, the advantage of QGIS is that it's free, uh, so anyone can download it and use it. Um, and also, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of the algorithms that you're using, you can dive down deep and find out how each of those packages work. Um, you can also just install the packages that you need, which means that it's kind of lighter on your computer. Um, that being said, the downside is there's no one to call uh, specifically if you if you need help um, and there's less uh, documentation. I don't know. I don't know if I can really say that it depends on which tools you're using, but uh, proprietary software, they have a lot of documentation and tutorials and uh, really uniform materials. Um, so that's something to think about uh, in terms of how to decide which which platform to use. Uh, but Ken might have a totally different take on it. Uh, so I, I think I think that was the only question I had uh, to me. Uh, and I might have to take off early to uh, pick up children from childcare. So I'm sorry okay. if I disappear. Uh, but thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity. And it was great uh, that you all could be here. And good luck on your data thon. I know you're going to do great. And I can't wait to see uh, the outcome. So good luck, you guys. Thank you very much. I think on behalf of everyone, uh, this was this was great. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, 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 Britta, to be uh, with us here today. Um, we do partner with Esri on the Datathon, so ArcGIS, I uh, can mention it, uh, will be available and there will be some kind of uh, uh, training webinars for that as well uh, in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. So Britta, thanks a lot for uh, for your presentation. Over to you, Ken. Uh, th thanks. Um, I I actually agree with Britta. So, I mean, OK, I'm in a slightly difficult position in the sense that I'm paid by Esri. So, you know, the the implication is that I would have to always, you know, suggest that people use ArcGIS and Esri products. Well, I mean, on one level, yes, um, but I, I kind of fell into being an Esri user. I was an academic for 20 years, um, Kingston University in London. And we taught students exactly this way, the way Britta was uh, explaining. We exposed them to all sorts of different software packages as well as data. So open source through to many, many different proprietary software. I just happened to be the guy that used the Esri products and I, I eventually, um, you know, moved to, to work for them. But, um, you know, you use what you're comfortable with, use what you've got access to. Um, sometimes if you're in an employment, you have to use what they've purchased. You don't have a choice. Um, you know, certain organizations will will push certain software more than others. Um, sometimes um, organizations don't have the funds to purchase um, proprietary software. There's lots of different models out of out there, and uh, I think that's not a bad thing, right? 
so go with what works for you i think is the um um is the main message and of course i can put you in touch with account managers if you want to buy some <laughs> if I want to buy some software <laughs> that's probably what i'd say thank you ken thanks for that um last word claudio claudio is going to tell us how to save money so we can uh, uh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm going to tell uh so now talking about the money uh what i said that when you're talking about the Cost. When I talk about the money, you have to see the the, the you have to look at the full sand. And uh, for example, the cost to building a hospital, a road, a, a industry, a shopping center, and uh, all kind of investment is much, 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 much higher than the cost of the production of statistical uh, information integrated with the spatial information. So if these investments are not made properly, there will be a lack of information a lot of money is wasted, wasted, just put in the trash. That's why uh, this kind of information save money, save a lot of money. That's what I I, I, I said in my my presentation. And uh, and talking about the the seminar, I think it was uh, very nice because you're talking about aspects of production of information, also aspect of the, the dissemination, the interpretation, the how how, how can you. Uh, 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 read the, this the geospatial information, then the, I think it's a, uh, a complete picture about the integrated information. Uh, and that's my my words. Thank you, and thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. No, thank you. The point is very well taken, Claudio, is that if you have better information, you will have better policies, and then you'll better spend public money on those policies and I think that 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 is very well taken. Um, thank you very much Ken, thank you very much Claudio. Uh, there was a question in the uh, in the chat about when data sets become available. So on the 26th of October we'll have a third the final webinar and then we will we'll, um, also open up data sets uh, that you can start looking at. But before that time Please have a look. There will be a lot of uh, links to uh, to all kinds of additional information, uh, like what we had today on the geospatial side. Please have a look at that for your teams, so you can prepare yourself in that sense. Again, uh, a very uh, big thank you to Ken, to Claudio, to Britta. Uh, a big hand of applause. It will be a virtual hand, unfortunately, but thank you very much and uh, a good day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with the dates, Sam. Thanks. Yes, good luck. Thank everyone. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good luck. Good luck, everyone. Bye bye.